Good morning. Hope you guys are ready for this. <sighs> Concise? No. I told Ray this morning, I said, Ray, I'm going to tell everybody that it says in the Bible that a student will become like his teacher. So you know what happened last Sunday, right? So uh, I've got an hour. I think it's an hour I've got. So no. It will be just exactly the amount of time needed. Uh, I've already timed it as I've uh, wanted to be respectful of our times in here. So um, you can see what I'm going to be preaching on. It's something that uh, I had to narrow down. I could do probably 12 to 15 points on this very area of God who is the great rebuilder and all the things that we could find in Nehemiah. And, uh, but I narrowed it down to four things. And uh, so, but I want to pray before we get started. And uh, let's uh, see what God's going to do in our hearts. Father, thank you so much for your word. Man, I was moved afresh at the, the thought of uh, there's, there, were, there was this place that was known as the Holy of Holies. And nobody could just meander in there, even curiosity. If somebody out of curiosity meandered into that place, they would be struck dead. Or if they had a sin that they didn't know about, it was a very serious place. And I was moved afresh. The thought of how you, you came into our world that was absolutely destroyed in every way. And uh, you chose to do something. Jesus, when you died, it says that the, the uh, curtain was torn from the top to the bottom and the Holy of Holies was now open to anybody to go in. But the cool thing is that I am seeing is that nobody was there anymore. You had now come out to greet us and give us the ability to live in a righteousness that we can stand up with our heads high without having to be perfect and we could have your righteousness on us. It wasn't connected to us, it is who we are because that's what you said in Colossians where it said that and in him you have been made complete. And we want to just tell you thank you for that but we still need you to Touch our hearts and our minds right now and let us hear what it is that you have to hear, that we have to hear, and that you need to say to us, Lord, so that we can um, make you happy by responding back to you according to what you tell us to do or get ready for. Amen. Well, in this book we get a chance to see some of the things about God and his heart about rebuilding our broken walls. And one of the things that I uh, was taken back by is the process that oftentimes God reveals specific things about himself and about us. And we don't, right now, we may not all have broken walls, some of, some of us, I'm not looking at anybody, I don't know of anybody who's got broken walls right now, but broken walls are a signal for something that we have to see. You got to understand that uh, we have the ability to mutate at a lower level and get used to it and think that it's common. In fact, we've been going through our Sunday school class about in his image and how we're beginning to accept certain things that were no that didn't used to be acceptable in in uh, school. Like a, a good one on the way here, we just saw a liquor store it says now open on Sundays. <laughs> you know, I don't want to make a big issue about that, but there was a deal where nobody sold liquor on Sundays and nobody had their restaurants open on Sundays, and then we get used to this and used to this and used to this. Pretty soon it's common. In the same way, we can get used to things, and there's times where God has to actually help us see that something's wrong, and we get a chance to see this in Nehemiah. There comes a time in all our lives when we will discover that we're in trouble or in a bad shape. Our walks are 
uh, our walls are broken down and our gates are burned and we just sense that we're in trouble and we're feeling shame. Now, if you're not in this boat, you still need to hear this message because there is a part for you in this. Even though we don't have walls that are broken down in our own personal lives, we need to be ready to step in when we find those who have this broken wall moment. And this broken walls, I want you to know, it represents anything in our lives that has led to a destruction. And some of you guys know my own past testimony. Uh, I carry a mugshot with me in my billfold. <laughs> <laughs> just simply because it reminds me of where I came from. And it was that time period where I had reduced my walls to rubble. They weren't just broken down. They were destroyed. They were burned. I felt shame all the time. I hated it. I hated it when the lights went out. I could drink myself into a, a, at least a numbness, but then when the numbness wore off, uh, I couldn't escape that something was wrong and God was trying to get uh, a hold of me and trying to show me these things. This can be either something that's relational, spiritual, emotional, financial. It's just anything that's out of place that needs to be rebuilt. So, sorry, didn't have the clicker out. You guys gave it to me. All right, so I do this one. I'm still kind of new at this. There we go. We're going to look at four things from this book. I'm going to just list them for you first. When God reveals our broken walls, positioning ourselves so the rebuilding can begin, our faith when building begins, and the last one is who God uses to rebuild. So let's look at the first one. When God reveals our broken walls, the importance of revelation. We're going to look at this. You have to have revelation. I got to tell you what, sometimes you can figure things out or you can get yourself just trying to figure things out. I mean, I remember the disciples were trying to figure out what Jesus had to say and, and they were arguing among themselves, about, especially about the bread. You know, when he said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. And I don't know why they just didn't turn to Jesus and say, what are you talking about? But what these guys did is they just had the answer right there in front of them, the, meaning they could have sought him, but what they chose to do is they all huddled together, and I picture them going, did you bring the bread? Who probably, Peter, you were supposed to bring the bread. They got into this big tivy of things and, and never really understood, and Jesus was going, and then they said, uh, he goes, why are you guys discussing that? And he tried to get them to go in a different direction, and, and, and finally he said, hey, I'm talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and, and, and Herod. And it was a great teaching moment, but they lost the ability to learn because they were busy trying to figure something out. And revelation is, is something that is beyond you. And it's real, you're going to see in here, it's real important to recognize when you are no longer in a position where you can see or obtain revelation from God because you will not shut up. Or you will not put your fears aside. And I've had my own that I've been a recipient of how God finally just pushed me aside and said, just grab my face, so to speak. It's a metaphor and say, stop, listen to me. And he revealed something that just settled everything in my life. And so we have broken wall moments. It's important of revelation. The first thing that must happen before we can see God's rebuilding is this. We must know and see clearly what needs to be repaired. In some cases, we are a people that, is, that are uh, addicted to, to uh, escaping or we'll deal with it tomorrow, or it can't be that bad, or, or what's the worst that could happen? I know Colleen hates it when I say it. What's the worst that happen? You know, it can happen? This road ought to lead to somewhere. <laughs> anyway, a little off the subject there, but the point is we must see clearly, the word is clearly here, what needs to be repaired before we can even begin 
to understand what to do. None of us will escape from this day when God chooses to reveal that something is wrong. The starting point of any rebuilding is to see clearly what's broken. God can't bring his plan of restoration until you are aware that something is wrong. This can be a very painful road to walk in, but truth sets people free. From this truthful picture of what's wrong, you can ask God accurately what is needed to be addressed so that his restoration can be experienced, not just seen. Sorry, I got some pages stuck together here. Ezra, did you do that when I had that left that up there? Glue my pages together. <clears throat> Actually stole a page from a guy one time. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he kept looking around. All right. God is the one who brings this revelation to us so we can see what's wrong. I was amazed... I was amazed at how many guys I used to, I, I did ministry in, in the jails for eight years, and I was amazed at the level of, I don't know if you want to call it ignorance, or the level that we can actually not know what's happening around us, even though you're at, the, even though you're at, a, at a low point, because they hadn't really gotten a revelation from God that, they are, that there's something wrong. They keep trying to do better things, and it's called jailhouse religion, by the way. And so I felt a call, after about the year of meeting with these guys, I found that one of the things I had to help them see is the gravity of and what, what, was, what helped them understand why things were going bad in their life. I even had one guy who used to tell me that he was so committed to Jesus and wanting to follow him, but when he got out, he got hungry and he didn't have a job, and so he stole to get food. And that's why he was in jail. I'll call him Jim. I don't think that is his Jim. Is there any Jims in here? So, oh my word, here we go. All right, it was not these guys, by the way. <laughs> I just looked at him and I said, Jim, you're so committed to Jesus. Why don't you die of starvation and honor God? He couldn't see that he was using this to actually do things that, that, that would put him back in jail, but he wasn't willing to turn away from it. And there were guys that, uh, that did. I said, hey, one guy in particular who, who, who was talking about what he had done, and, and he was taking a, an, a, a plea bargain, and, and Tim knows about these things, is these guys will all of a sudden say, well, uh, if they'll just say it this way and this way, and you'll admit to this, then we'll get less of a of a, a, a sentence. And I just looked at him and his name was Will and that was his name. There are any Wills in here, is there? There isn't, good. <laughs> is, I said, Will, did you do it? He said, yeah. I said, you trust Jesus? And he was a sincere follower. He said, yeah. I said, then tell the judge you're guilty and you follow God. You follow what God lays out for your life. And I met him afterwards, and he showed me. He goes, man, I, I, he went in and he did that, that very thing. I didn't know he was going to do that, but he did. And he ended up getting a path from God that was amazing. There are many ways of revelation. So here's a good question. When you read Nehemiah, how did he know that something was wrong? I'm just going to throw that out there. Does anybody want to throw any Bible scholars? Dan, you're not included on this one because I know you'll just... <laughs> How did Nehemiah know that the wall was broken? Anybody want to take a guess if they don't... Huh? Yes. Someone told him. He was eating lunch. He was absolutely fine. It says right here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Read the underline. It says that Hanani, one of my brothers came with certain men from Jew, Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews, hey, is he's taking a drink and eating his meal, and he's fine. Nehemiah is fine at this point. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. 
He got an accurate count of details, who's involved, and what's really going on. And I am sure he could not finish his meal if he was eating. I don't know whether he's eating or not. But the point is, we have a time where we just stop and we see these things. This wall had been torn down and in this condition for a long time. But God was awakening a heart of concern in Nehemiah through these accurate reports. God chooses many ways to bring things to our attention that, we, that are our broken wall moments. He uses people, falls or consequences of your own, passages you read, falls or consequences of others, many other things to get your attention. I will tell you, I didn't put on there uh, your conscience. At one point, you're just wondering what's going on. Your conscience is what's called bothering you. And again, we can disregard it, and we can actually let it go, but there's a time where our conscience begins to be something that God begins to help us understand that we need to be listening. Now, uh, Nehemiah didn't have a conscience at that point that was bad. Or there wasn't anything going on. It was developed right there at that moment, and all of a sudden he saw some things that needed to be seen that God brought into his life. He did not. He wasn't praying that God would help him understand these things. You understand, we got to be ready at any moment that God's just going to say, okay, it is time to help this person understand that they need to be in prayer or something. And those are the times where I wake up and I go, okay, something's wrong. I think this is serious. And I usually go downstairs and I just go, God, what's going on? And I lay there many times in silence, but I'm not down there going, I think it's probably time for me to... Uh, talk to God about something. I'm usually moved by something, and our conscience can do that. The important thing I want us to understand is God cares enough to help you and I see what He sees so you can call out to Him and change the course of direction for your benefit. I didn't write these out. I'm just, I just want you to just kind of take these in. This is from Psalm 107. Read four passages. Some wandered, and this is the 107, I'm going to start in verse 4. Some wandered in deserts, wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then, then, after all of that, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He, the Lord, delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Then starting in verse 10, some sat in darkness in, sh uh, in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in iron, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their heads down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. That was great that that happened because this is what happened to them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Third one, starting in verse 17. Some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death. But then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and He delivered them from their distress. He sent out His word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Last one. They mount, this is verse 26. They mounted up to the heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their, uh, uh, in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wits end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still. The waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. 
then it goes on further in here and it says, Blessed be the Lord who does these things. But these people clearly came to a position where they, they couldn't stand it any longer. There was something, just something in wrong inside them, either outside their, th outside their minds or outside themselves. I mean, it's a physical thing coming at them. Like with me, I, man, I burned through all my money and I did terrible things. And I, I had great friends who continued to give me stuff, but I had so many nights. I lived in my car. Some of you guys don't know that. I lived in my car for a while in my rebellion against the Lord. And it was a 68 Opal. Now, if you guys don't know anything about a 68 Opal, Take a Volkswagen and cut it in half, and that's the size of the car. <laughs> okay, it wasn't quite that small. But I lived in my car while people were trying to reach out to me because I would not see clearly and acknowledge the devastation around me, nor was I willing to seek God at that time. Accurate account of what's wrong fuels our prayers. Look at this. Nehemiah. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I love this. Combine this passage with it. I can't remember the, the address of it is, but it says, uh, be still and know that I'm God or discover. What are you laughing at? You ever heard address before? <laughs> haven't you heard an ad address? The Bible verse is an address? You haven't? Oh, man. Yeah, we used to say it all the time. So wherever that address is at, it, it's out there somewhere. But it says, be still. And I love this. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down. I tell guys when they're in the middle of some quandary or something, I go, quit pacing or quit, quit trying to get paper or make phone calls or trying to get counsel and stuff. Just sit down. It says, when a man wants to build a tower... What's the first thing he's supposed to do? He sits down and estimates the cost. God needs this in us, but we need accurate accounts. And there's a, there is a, man, Ezra, did you glue these two together too? I'm not going to leave that thing with you ever again. Okay. Um, you did. Man, you little stinker. There we go. This takes time. It takes time seeking in prayer. Folks, can I encourage you to stop and hear clearly what is wrong at the time of bad news or the thing where you begin to have quandary? We often don't get a clear picture of what we need to take from, uh, take before the Lord without his revelation. David, Nehemiah took four days. David took three days when he found out. I mean, I'm blown away. Let me just make a point here. David didn't know that he was in trouble when Nathan came. And those of you that don't know the story, he committed adultery with Bathsheba and he tried a long period. I don't know how long it was, that, but it was months of where he... Uh, deri or tried to do things to, to get it to, to cover this whole thing up and after he had he had uh, in a dastardly way killed Bathsheba's husband uh, by way of tricking him into going out in the front lines and telling David told his own good men pull back from him and that's how Uriah died. David didn't know that something was wrong. He didn't. Because Nathan came along and told him the story, an accurate story. And it was from that story that David said, Oh, man, I would kill that man. And Nathan said, You're the man. And I've had those moments where brothers have come to me. I remember one in particular who I just... I described what I thought I should do over something that I thought I had a righteous right to actually react in a certain way. And he listened to me. And he stepped into me and he said, you, brother, have wrapped your lie around God's word. When I saw that from another person's perspective, I went out to my car. We were uptown and I, I wept because I believed it and I couldn't see it. It came from the outside and God sent a person into my life to help me see that moment. And I wept because I went, God... I am doing things that I didn't think I would be doing. 
And I was so glad, I want you to understand, God's going to bring revelation. And God brought revelation to both these guys. And they acted. And they did something. A couple of things you need to watch out for. Be careful of <laughs> turning into a Mr. Freak Out person, <laughs> which I have done for a season. Or a Mr. and Mrs. Fix It person during these times of seeking and prayer. We can oftentimes begin to start doing Google on how to fix this. I'll give you one. Some of you have heard this. I remember when my basement sprung a leak <laughs> from the main line into the house the day before I was supposed to go to Houston for a couple of weeks, <laughs> or I think a week and a half or something. And when I saw it, we were going to be mo we were going out there with a team to do ministry with the, in Houston, and and uh, and it just I just I felt the carpet, and then I I remember going, oh, how did this happen? And I opened up the door where the handle shut on and off shut, valve was, and there was this small little drip drip drip, and I immediately went into freak out mode. Of course, usually with freak out mode, there oftentimes you can tell because you begin to cast doubt on God's leadership, or why didn't he tell me this, or I can't believe this is happening. And God stopped me, gave me revelation, and just said, uh, in, not in audible words, but he said, who owns the house? And I was easily able with revelation, I said, you do. And I said, what are you? I said, I'm the manager. And I said, I'm freaking out because I just don't know what to do. <laughs> but I settled the issue and all the anxiety left when I went, okay, this is your house. What would you like me to do? And his plan became known over the next 30 minutes. I go, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. So we need to have that. And I'm going to put a last one in here that I don't have on this slide. Be careful not to run. I've done that before too. Deny that something's wrong and you go busy yourself with something else in ministry so that you don't have to try to think about what's going on. Now it's time to stop. It takes time in prayer. So let's go on to number two. How to position ourselves so that the rebuilding can be begin. This is probably one of the most important uh, subject. This one here is probably the most important of all of these steps because it addresses that God has oftentimes brought people to this level of where there's revelation, but they end up doing something that's counter to it because they don't address this one thing. The heart must be addressed first before rebuilding can begin. No one can re be rebuilt without no one can rebuild without repentance. And repentance can't happen unless you feel the pain of what went wrong. This is not a fault-finding mission at this point or expedition, but a clear understanding of how things got broken in the first place. This is really important. I want to show you a couple of these things. Look at John, John, in John 5, verse 14, Jesus came back to a guy who he had healed. He had been there for 38 years, and Jesus made this point to him. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Stop sinning that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but at 38 years of being in this position, and it can get worse than this, that is crazy, but he points it back to stop sinning. This guy's heart had not been changed, and Jesus gives us a glimpse of what he expects from us. There's sometimes we need to look and see whether there is sin. This isn't about, oh, don't make me feel guilty. There is a time where it's okay to accept the fact that we can actually go, how did this get this way in this first place so that you can go back and address it? So God, and you, what you do, you're following back here and he goes, don't look at all these other stuff, the destruction. I want you to see this one thing. And when you get it corrected, then all of a sudden light comes in and you can begin to see things that are accurate. And it's called positioning yourself. I was amazed to find out, uh, and when, you, when you read the book of Job, you'll see uh, at the end of Job, uh, you see him going, 
I repent. And I remember when the first time I read that, man, your whole family got taken from you. Everything's devastated. And you come to the place where you see that you need to repent. But he did. And when you read it, God just laid it out for him. And in that particular situation, I went, I side with you, God. And Nehemiah was good. I want to be a man like Nehemiah that in all of what looks like unfairness, there was a time where God got his heart and he said, I repent. We mistakenly try and rush past this part. But you can see from Nehemiah taking the time to address this, why they were in this place of their broken walls. And here it is. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules and you, as you, that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. When I got my license taken away for five years, I remember going through the moments where I just got it in the mail and I was at that moment where I'm going, I was, I was following the Lord at that time. But this came after 10 years of drinking and, and living a lifestyle where I just disregarded the law altogether. And uh, so they deemed me a habitual traffic violator because of all those uh, three or four DUIs and I don't know all the different things. But when I got it, I went, God, how can, how can you... How can you allow this? I asked him an honest question. I go, I'm following you. I don't get it. And he quoted his own words to me. He said, as a man sows, so he shall reap. You know what's weird is that brought comfort to me. He helped me understand you're not going to get out of this. And I was able to just, I was able to just come to a conclusion, okay, all right. I did. I lost my license for five years, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a city thing. It was now a federal offense. I would have gone to prison if I would have been driving. I did drive one time, only one time, and God used a car behind me to get pulled over, and I cried like a baby because I thought it was me. And I went home, and I told God, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> and uh, so he revealed that one to me. So um, the point is, Revelation is, is uh, great. And it's what we need. And then when we get that revelation, learning how to position ourselves before him. And, and Nehemiah was actually able to tell God what he saw. He was actually in his prayer. He was able to he was, listen. Uh, Saul's. You guys know the story about Saul, Saul and David. I'm just going to read it to you. And if you guys don't know the story about Saul, you'll have to go read it because I, I don't want to take up. Yeah, I got to keep going. Saul's mistake. All he. All he said when he was caught doing the things that he was not supposed to do out of fear, he said, I've sinned. You're thinking, oh, great, this guy is on the road, right? But it was not, he wasn't interested in seeing his sin from God's perspective. 1 Samuel 15, verse 24 says this, And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. But Saul was not interested or willing to take the time to see what God wanted him to do. His pain was that he felt that his pain was only for himself. As opposed to David, who took the time, spent three days in prayer, and after his broken walls were exposed, he spent time in prayer. And it says he took three days. Since you need God's involvement to rebuild, then it would be wise for you to take the time to let him lead you in how he sees this. I want to show you one last thing. We're going to take note of something how to do this. And we're going to go on to the next subject. I want you to see in Nehemiah how he honored God even though he was talking as though he was guilty. Look at this. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who 
love him and keep his commandments. You notice how he's addressing God? He's not accusing him of anything. You can go on down there. He confessed the sins of his people, including himself. But he first says something that's great. And he says, man, you are great. You are awesome, God. You keep your covenants and you're steadfast in love. And your love is towards those who love him. They, he had something that said back positive. So let me encourage you with this. During this examination time, it's okay to agree with God. I think I put that up there. It's okay to agree with God on the destruction that he has brought onto you, but include the, the things that you know who he is. He is good. He is compassionate. He is faithful. He desires rebuilding. He loves being with his people. He is faithful to lead you in a right direction for your own benefit. It's good for you to let that come out of your mouth while you're over here talking about the destruction that you see. All right, let's go on to number three. Our faith when God begins to rebuild. This is very, very, very important because I will tell you, some Christians just melt down into a, well, I deserve this, I just better get used to this, uh, I, I'm just going to live the rest of my life like this, this, and whatever. It goes back and forth. I didn't know that when I was in the rebuilding time period, I needed to understand and hear from God that he wanted me to actually apply faith to something that I didn't think was possible for me. Listen to some of these things. God rebuilds what he has allowed to be destroyed. Look at Nehemiah. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. And then he says something amazing. But if you return to me and make, keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. He's actually proclaiming something that he could look forward to and the rest of the people could look forward to because he believed and understood the level of uh, restoration that God could bring. And it was something that I had to actually wake up to in my rebuilding moments. It requires our faith to let God have his way when looking to rebuild. We must believe that he has something good in mind or discover, I'm going to put discover first, and then believe, even as you can see all the destruction around you. Here's the deal. You cannot walk in the steps of rebuilding if you have not heard that God is willing to rebuild. You cannot do that. Let me give you some examples of how God does this. Here's some examples. Peter. After Peter had arrogantly said, all are going to fall away except for me, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And I've narrowed this down. He said more, but he said, after you've repented, I want you to go help your brothers. You go, wow, he put that in there. He also told him later on, he goes, uh, I, want you to I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to tend to my sheep. He gave Peter a clear goal that I'm going to use you in the ministry. I want you to know that fall. And he went through a bad fall on this one. You'll have to read it for yourself. Peter should not have said that. Jesus clearly told him, your walls are going to go down tonight. You're going to deny me three times, which is something that was way beyond what Peter was willing to even accept. And he, I'm sure he was going, hey, it ain't happened to me. I'm going to, I'm going to protect you. Jesus spoke in very clear terms. Another one. I love this one. Zechariah 10.6. I will strengthen Judah. This is after their destruction. I will strengthen Judah and save Israel. I will restore them because of my compassion. It will be as though I had never rejected them. I'm telling you, it will take your faith when you're at that place when you feel like you've been rejected or you deserve to be rejected. And you've come around, you've repented, and now you're starting to get up, and now you've got to have faith in this. I tell you, I'm going to give you mine. <laughs> I 
I remember when I was like, okay, this is good enough. I'll, I'll just live this way. God promised me this. Marshall, I can restore more than what the locust has eaten. And I opened up that door of going, well, do I have the right to really hope in that? And then I said, yes. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And look at me now. I'm a guy that carries a mug shot, and you guys ordained him. <laughs> Hey, Amen. <laughs> I told, uh, I told uh, 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 in one of my preachings that says, you know, when we, when we get a bicycle from God, we can learn to ride it or we can pop wheelies with it. <laughs> and I chose, you know what, I'm going to build those ramps when we used to be as kids. And let's see how high this bike can go. We got band-aids nowadays. Anything. One thing I have seen through the scriptures is this. God is able, I want you to hear this. God is able to reveal a destruction that is happening now or is coming and he's able to describe at just as in detail the restoration that he has in store. Over and as I read through the Old Testament over and over and over again, God in the same sentence, in the same setting, in the same paragraph can actually describe such destruction that's coming on these people because of this. And then he goes over here like, okay, okay, we're done with that. And let me tell you, we're over here going, what? And he's going, no, follow me. I want to tell you. Now listen, this is what I've got planned. And, and he begins to describe something. And I go, we got to hear those things because God knows that we are built to live on hope. And we can't hope if we will not take our faith and go, I hear this. In the middle of my destructive time, at my darkest time period where everything was gone from me, and I'm not going to go into the detail where that was at, I just know the feeling of no hope was absolutely the, the, the accurate in its feeling. And I didn't know what to do, and I was just like, I can't believe I'm in this situation. I was out mowing my yard, and I was like, I'm fully engulfed in hopelessness. And then God brought Jeremiah 29, 11 to me and says, I know the plans that I have for you, Marshall. Plans for good and not for calamity. And I'm kind of a little bit snide here. Yeah, right. When's that going to happen? To give you a future and a hope. And I remember that so clearly that at that moment, I stopped and I discovered if you said that, then what is it that I need to do? And I went, okay, there is no hope. There was no hope at this point. I couldn't get it from what I could see. But I believed, okay, I'll join you. If you said I'm going to have a future and a hope, this is not my future. If it is, I don't want it. <laughs> but no, I wasn't supposed to get used to it. I remember the moment where everything went calm in my mind because I went, so you're going to take care of my future and hope. And it was after that that he began to reveal some of the restorative things that he was going to be bringing me through. God needs our faith when he is ready to rebuild. Be ready for a big rebuild. God is good at rebuilding. That is why he came as a carpenter. Don't you love that? He wanted us a good shepherd, but he came as a carpenter. His image, his character was a carpenter, a guy who rebuilds many things. So who God uses to rebuild? I'm bringing this to a close here, and I'm not going to read it all, but I want you to get, I want you to capture something here. In Nehemiah, you see uh, the things underlined. In Nehemiah 3, 1 through 13, the first part of it, you can just kind of use your own reading thing and just, just go through that. You can see that he rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built. They consecrated it, set its doors in place. They consecrated as far as the Tower of Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hamel. So these two, these guys built to this part. And then you get this. Next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakor, the son of whatever that name is, built. And the sons of Hazanah built the fish gate. 
They laid its beams and set its doors and bolts and bars. It wasn't the same people. It was one right after another. And next to them, the sons of Uriah, the sons of how, whatever that is, repaired. And next to them, the sons of Barak, the son of whatever that is, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the sons of Banana, repaired. I know it's not Banana, but I just thought I couldn't keep from it. I don't know how to pronounce it. I haven't taken Dan's class on knowing how to do these things. Look at this, over and over again. And next to them, a different person. I really want you to get this picture. If your walls are not broken down and you're walking fine because God has blessed you, that's good. But be ready. You're the one that needs to possibly be chosen to do a particular building in somebody else's wall. And most of these, it says, they built what was in front of their houses. <laughs> It was in front of them. So you're going to run into these people and there's no accident that you're meant to be one of these ones that needs to repair this, built this. Goldsmiths repaired over and over again. On and on and on. We see this, that God uses next to them, they, repel, they rebuilt the wall. Here's what I want you to hear. We get the book of Nehemiah, but Nehemiah did not build that wall. It was men who he instructed and gave them opportunity. In one particular case, you know what the qualifications were? It was a father and his two daughters <laughs> because the wall was right across from them. So they got out their tools and stuff and they went out and they started repairing the walls. I want to tell you something that God gave me a great revelation that, that I just love. Uh, and that is, as I was going through this, he pointed out all of you who has been a part of rebuilding my walls. <laughs> and I love it because I turn around and I look at the past 15 years of my life and it's across the cities and different places, people that I could just name. And some of you, you, some of them you just saw, they were the pastors, but they were different church groups that I'd been in, or churches that I'd been involved with. And it was God's, his, his desire to rebuild my walls and he used individuals. Well, you're those individuals that rebuild walls. So I really want you to go home today and say, God, give me tools, or at least recognize what tools I have and I'll keep them by the door just in case I need to go into your life or my life and we need to do this so the worship team can come up now I really want to come down to this I want you to see this I love this image it is the master builder the carpenter he knows how to rebuild walls after he shows it to us he comes and he brings his tools, things that he has gifted us in because he is a great rebuilder and he uses us to rebuild those. So, remember to seek God's revelation when we start to get some whiff. We begin to see our broken walls. Ask for his revelation. Number two, learn how to position ourselves or yourselves so the rebuilding can begin and know that it will require your faith somewhere along the time to let go of your failure so that building can begin and God can have his way to build you the way he's always wanted to do it. And last, remember God uses his people to rebuild his walls.